Try it. <laughs> okay, well, we'll get started. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. So glad to have you back to visit us. Uh, and another member of the Cardiff Psychology family. Hello, that's good to be here. Trained. And uh, yeah, I think we overlapped a lot when you were high TPC mm -hmm. there as well. That's great. And of course, you're our external examiner. For a while, yeah. Good or for bad. <laughs> Not sure if I'm Royal sure Master's I'm program. Easier. <laughs> but yes, uh, and it's funny, I remember just as you were coming to the end of your term, for your external examiner, you were, you were getting this project started. Um, mm -hmm. So super in intrigued to hear about it okay well Great. Over i to... didn't stick this abstract up here for you to read it obviously it was to have to be a little story about how i came to give this talk um so what happens when you give uh, a talk is, is someone lovely ring emails you and says you know would you like to give a talk at our lovely prestigious institution and your ego goes slightly wild and you say of course i would oh i've not really got very much to say because i'm yeah you know, i've got i you know, last time i gave a talk it was a while back Oh, well, it'll be ages away, so you don't have to worry about it. We've got a lovely audience. So, yes, of course, I agreed to do it. Um, and then not too long after that, oh, could you send a title and an abstract? Of course, at that point, there is no title, there is no abstract, there is no research because it's not actually happened yet. So I dutifully did some imaginary work. And then today, here we are. Um, I've turned this imaginary project into something real. So it is a work in progress, and I want you to think of it as a work in progress. And I'm looking for comments and things like that that may be able to improve on what we've got. So hopefully there's some overlap between the abstract and, and the content. So here's the title. Um, so titles uh, around looking at people's interactional work around the organization of, uh, of, of digital payments and how people make digital payments using mobile apps and we've for a while I've been working in this program we call this kind of work about how people use money how people make money work for their money work so we're exploring actual so we're looking at real world situations situated practices using in, in which people use instances of payment and um, although we do less on this here today because as I said we haven't quite finished the work we do this primarily to draw design inspirations and design implications to support those payment practices and uh, for everyone who's, I think everyone here probably has got a, a, a good idea of what ambiguity means, it's the quality of being open to more than one interpretation. So how do people resolve uh, multiple interpretations where interactions are symmetrical, where they have two directions that appear to be um, equally valid? And uh, a particular instance of this symmetry is solved by people asking this question, do you scan you? Do I scan you or do you scan me? And the work was done with uh, Christian Griffin Hagen and uh, Zhongyu Li, uh, both of whom are sociologists working in Hong Kong and China. So the topic actually falls into this kind of broad uh, area of, of uh, interactions with Buddy. It's a program I've been looking at for a while, but specifically sport explores ambiguity in interaction to solve the question. That's a typical HCI question, really, of, of what do I do now? I mean, that's probably the, 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 the most common question asked in, in, in HCI research is you see something and you think, what do I do now? It's that flashing cursor that we're all used to. Um, and that's a topic of, as I said, interest to HCI, but also ambiguity has uh, an interesting uh, role in design. Actually, uh, Bill Gave has talked about ambiguity as being used as a resource in design. And that's a nice kind of, orientation to think about how can we how can we use this so Bill Gava writes ambiguity of information finds its source in the artifact itself ambiguity of context in the socio-cultural discourses that are used to interpret it probably that's the closest area to what we're going to talk about today and ambiguity of relationships in the interpretive and evaluative stance of the individual so this sits within CSCW human computer interaction to an extent um, UX because it involves digitally mediated acts of payment happening through some kind of technology and between different people. You can't have a, a payment by yourself. There must be some uh, two sides to any transaction. <clears throat> a transaction is a form of interaction. And it kind of moves towards this idea of, of service design. How can we design uh, services that allow people to perform and to engage, to, 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 
to, to, to, to receive some kind of service from another person or another thing. And of course, this maps to this kind of gradual increase, uh, increasing the or, or orientation to money, and particularly, and looking at Lana Schwartz's work here, how money is a form or is, is increasingly being used as a form of social media as payments become embedded within uh, social media systems, or about social media systems becoming embedded in payment systems. And we're looking at how you can look at edge cases of this. This is beginning to happen elsewhere, but in China, well, I was maybe expecting to see some MSc students, many of whom would have been Chinese, um, but actually we haven't got those uh, here today. Looking to China to, to understand that, because why China? They have an incredibly uh, rich infrastructure of payment systems or financial systems. They've got this massive critical mass, hundreds of millions of users using it very regularly. It's mature. Um, so this technology isn't something we're introducing as an experimental HCI study and saying, try this, use it for a week. How is it? This is something that's been used for an extensive amount of time. And we've got lots of emerging practices of use about how people understand it and how people regularly um, match their behaviors because they have expectations of other people. And those expectations are usually uh, realistic. In China, though, we have a very different system, particularly for face-to-face -face payments. They have this um, different system to everywhere else because they use QR codes for payment. And this will become very visible in, in, the, in some of the rest of the talk because it, it, it's a different form of payment and it happens in a different way and it has different practices that build around it. And I wanted to also think about this question of new payment technology is often described in the literature as, as disruptive. And often that's talked about at the level of institutions and banking systems and financial systems. We wanted to see perhaps how this fed into um, everyday life. So I said China has these uh, QR codes used for payment. I don't know if any of you have seen these uh, being used, uh, they, even probably around London now because WeChat is so uh, pervasive within the uh, student community um, of students, uh, of, of Chinese students. So these are everywhere. You'll see these um, in China payment everywhere. So the ubiquitous massive penetration of these with a vast amount of daily payments that take place over it and, and massive values. I mean, trillions of, um, uh, of one, but it's software-based. So it's apps, these kind of super apps that have social media embedded inside them, operating on these very, very complex platforms with many different forms of financial service uh, that are in there. And again, that's very different to the rest of the world. I think we may see more of it. And I think you know, you've seen Elon Musk's idea of Twitter as becoming a super app, hoping to embed financial services inside of that. You may begin to see more of that well, um, you may not see it from Twitter because Elon Musk seems to be burying it, but uh, it may happen somewhere else. But what do we see when we have um, QR codes? They lead to something that we think um, can be described as kind of interactional ambiguity. And of course, you see this across other forms of, of human computer interaction or interface designs. But our focus on this is thinking about the impact of this ambiguity on how people work together and how that affects the way that they they progress in interaction between themselves over time. Uh, because either in the, in the case of these uh, uh, QR code or, or mobile phone based uh, uh, interactions, either user can initiate a transaction. So there's a, there's a, uh, uh, this is where the symmetry of the interactions come in, comes in. It's not uh, like walking up to a magnetic payment device or a, 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 a till based scanning system Either, either person can initiate or take payment. So it's very different um, because of those QR codes. Why? Because all phones uh, have interactive displays and cameras. So each of them can be a, um, a leader or, on a, or a follower in the payment. And we've described this as having a symmetric model of control where those payments can be taken or led. Um, and I think this is a very novel uh, form. The buyer can actually lead the transaction. So rather than presenting their material to be the money to be taken, they can actually run the operation by scanning the buyer's QR code and making the payment directly to them, which is novel. What does that symmetricality offer? Well, it allows this kind of much more flexible organization of the payment process. People can behave, can arrange themselves and do payments in a very different way. 
uh, around that because of this directionality of control. And of course, this is a novel form of, of, of money work. And I'll give you a, a little a, examine, a different set of examples here. So this is where the customer might scan the merchant to make the payment. The person points their device at the QR code, takes the photo of it, which allows them to make a payment to that unique identifier and uh, progress from there. Uh, this is the more standard form, but of course it is QR code based. So it's not, uh, it's not a magnetic form. But if, each, if either side can lead on that interaction, um, how do we know who should be leading it? So there's a question in people's minds is what do I do now? The research methods, I probably don't know, need to go into these too, uh, too deeply because I think a lot of people here will recognize them. I was maybe expecting a, uh, a, a more masters-based audience here, but we use video-based interaction analysis to look at it. It's lovely as a technique because it allows us to pull all the different sorts of, uh, of media out together so we can uh, account for how conversations are interwoven with the kind of visual media around them, how people point to things, how day access works how digital media are pulled into things, how spatial layouts affects the way that interactions occur and how these things are paced temporarily. So how do they shape transactional process, progress? How do these things uh, get to shape transactional progress can be accounted for within this method and resolve those interactional difficulties around these problems that we see, particularly of ambiguity. Um, again, need to go in huge detail here, but it's qualitative. We're, we're looking for orderliness. How do people create order in their lives and how do people um, orient towards the patterns and what sort of patterns do we even see as researchers? We can pull these multimodal components. It's non-theoretical. We're not kind of thinking about what might be going on in people's heads. It's very much about what do we see. It takes a EMCA, so an ethnomethodological and conversation analytic perspective using that video data and you'll see some of that in the analytic uh, uh, approach that we take. Um, but essentially what we're asking in this, uh, with this technique is how do people make sense of the things that they see in order to be able to act appropriately at the, at the next stage? And then how do they take turns in progressing a form of conversation interaction? So I do this, that would lead you to expect that you should be speaking now. Perhaps this is a time when I can now interject with the next point. How do these things actually uh, happen? Now, we did data collection over at what we did it. My Chinese uh, colleagues uh, did this 500 video recordings of individual transactions going through. And if you're doing video analysis, that is an enormous amount of recordings. Uh, interesting period. So this is pre-pandemic pre, um, to early pandemic stages. And it was done across a variety of different um, uh, uh, cities across the bottom corner of, of China and across a variety of different transactional settings, uh, both using the two big uh, Chinese payment apps, WeChat Pay and Alipay. Now let's move to think about how normal payment practices would work using this. I'm gonna take the instance of WeChat Pay. Alipay works in a somewhat similar way. Essentially the, the same progression of interaction on the interface is largely the same again, depending on how you interact with it. I'm going to talk you through two normal forms of practice where there is very little ambiguity. And we can ask, why is there very little ambiguity when we look at these? Then we'll start to think about when those situations become ambiguous. So the first video fragment um, is where the seller scans the customer with a scan gun. And this is how a normal form of interaction progresses. Then we'll look at the other way around. So this is the other form of uh, the symmetrical interaction where the customer scans the seller's QR code. And you can see how this actually transforms a little bit of the set of behaviors that can take, around, take place and the activities that can take place around payment. You'll notice that in very, these instances, there is very little talk in both of those. So there's not much need to organize around any forms of ambiguity that occurred here. And of course, taking you through these videos um, should allow you to catch up pretty quickly with uh, how the analytic process uh, will work. Now, both of the uh, videos that we've got have screen recordings accompanying them. So you'll actually be able to see on the side of the screen um, how uh, the interaction progresses. And what I will do is I'll play this one, I think twice, because it moves quite quickly and you've got to get used to the, the process. But this is the payment where someone walks into uh, a shop, picks up some watermelon, 
and it jumps through to the next uh, slide to, to, to him taking it through to the till. So let's play. So the customer walks up to the cashier, the watermelon, the scanner scans it, he presents his uh, device, scanned, and taken away. Now, very, very quick, I will do that again. Mari, I will also talk you through how this progresses um, using the form of transcription that we've developed that should minimally, uh, the sort of minimal uh, viable, viable uh, analytic scheme. Walks into the cashier, boxes of watermelons. He, the cell is inputting the things, takes the scanner up. He's not ready, puts the scanner down, scans him, bags it up. A confirmation comes through on the device and he can leave. So why is this progression so obvious? Why does he know what to do? Well, probably because there's a very visible scanner gun, which says, you know, I have a scanner, I'm going to be able to scan this interaction. This is not a scan using another phone, it's a scanner. So you don't have to know CA to be able to, to talk through these slides. And I've tried to identify where the, uh, the interactions happen on the screen. So customer puts watermelon on the scale, in, the seller inputs items into the register. So this is where the, the price and the, and, the, and the weight goes in. At this point, the customer opens up the WeChat application. The seller lifts the scan gun ready to scan. So now we know, oh, this is something that's going to happen to the phone. The customer's, not, the, the customer's not quite ready for it. He presses the WeChat button, plus button, which allows him to get to the point of interaction where he can pull up some form of payment. The seller now sees that there's nothing on his phone because she can actually orient to what's, uh, what's visible on his phone. So she lowers the scan gun. The... Then customer selects the money button. This is where he's able to make a choice about whether he scans or is scanned. And at this point, the WeChat pay code appears. Seller pivots whilst he's doing this, grabs a bag, and we now moved here. So the, the customer shows the WeChat paid QR code towards the seller. The seller sees the WeChat code, so she can uh, she can directly orient towards this. She doesn't. She's not correcting him. So yes, this looks like the right thing to do. Pivots, licks up, picks up the scan gun, scans it, presses the register screen. Bang, it's done. A uh, customer withdraws the phone and the seller uh, scrolls down. So this is now uh, at the point where the announcement happens that the payment's been successful. The watermelon's passed back to, uh, to the customer and the interaction finishes. All happened very, very quickly. So this is very simple form of interaction. It actually seems almost like a credit card payment or an Apple Pay, uh, Apple Pay payment where there's a combination of actions that happens here. Um, that, that's going on. So it's a very um, it's a very straightforward set of things that are going on. You pay you pay me to present your contents, a bit like a credit card. I'll do the work. But there's a combination of actions here that that's going on. There's no announcement uh, of of what to do, and just the price appears on the till. Why would the price appear on the till and no one provide any more explanation? Because I, the the seller, I'm going to do the work. The readying here of the scanner leads to this kind of reasonable interpretation uh, of the buyer being uh, uh, merely a service passenger in the form of the interaction and the, uh, uh, the seller um, doing the, um, the control in this. So what do we see here? The action structured and formatted. And it's formalized into a passive payment encounter. This is the way that it's obvious things will be done because of the sense making that's going on around it. We can see what should be happening because there are no alternative um, opportunities here. Mostly the money work here is being done by someone who does a lot of it. That is you know, the seller here. They, they are experienced at using the till, uh, but the customer still has to do some degree of money work in preparing uh, the QR code. And we see a lot of this where the customer is scanned, scanner gun use is very common. So there's lots of different sorts of instances where people are picking on a scanner. You can see the one we've just done here where people are having content uh, scanned. But it also happens with mobile phones. So we're going to move to video fragment two. This is the other normal form, well, 
the reverse form, the, the symmetrically reverse form of payment where the customer is scanning the seller. Um, so we've got phone recording and again, very little talk going on here. I'll play this twice. Weighs it, announces the price. The seller announces the price. Questions it? Code. Scans it. Scans it. Scans it. Puts in the price. Answer. So, I don't think you need to see that again. You should have picked up everything because I will walk through that uh, fairly quickly. So here, seller. First thing she does now that the, the, the sweet corn's been presented, she says 3.51. Customer questions it. Absolutely, you've got to get this right. 3.51, because she may have to do the scanning. The seller says yes. The customer looks for their WeChat app, opens the WeChat, presses the plus button. This is the point where you have to choose whether you scan or you are scanned. During that time, importantly, the seller serves another customer. We'll come back to that. The customer selects the scan button from this point over on the interface on the right. The customer moves the phone towards the WeChat QR code. The woman's not even looking at her. She knows something's going on, but she's not uh, visibly orienting to her. So it seems that everything's progressing normally. She scans the QR code. Um, the customer then inputs the price and presses pay. Uh, of course, at this point, the seller is still serving the other customer. She puts in a password and uh, the customer has a, a payment appearing on the screen. You can see there, she shows the payment result towards the seller. You can see that the response has come through positive. You don't want to have someone walking off without making a payment. Um, and she takes a sweet corn and, uh, and, and moves off. So the seller's you know, kind of interaction here, and largely the only interaction that she actually uh, says through speech, is 3.51. And that has no further reaction to the customer and immediately orients to the next person who's just over her, sh her, her right shoulder. And this seems to be a statement about how much to ready for payment in the same way that you would ask someone for physical change. You know, you'd say, that'd be £2.50. So that's got an analogy to physical change that places the onus on the buyer to do the work of paying as much as they would do if they were uh, paying with, with, with money. So what, you know, let's walk through what we see here. Customers are being served in parallel. The seller, who's the lady um, in, in pink there, has no visible phone or scanner, but has very, very visible QR codes indicating that I can take payment. Not necessarily that I will take payment, but that I can take payment. The seller makes no attempt to ready a device. It's like, come on, it's your, your move now. She just waits and watches and gets on with other stuff. So the customer opens the WeChat, selects the scan button, scans the, the QR code. Again, no interaction is made by the seller to say, what on earth are you doing? And there is no payment talk. No talk in a technology-mediated interaction is generally indicated, no problem. But that's not how it always happens. Uh, interactions can be ambiguous and those need to be resolved in order for people to know what to do at this point. You don't want people just standing at a till going, oh, what do I do? How do we progress this? And that requires some kind of micro payment work, which I think C uh, CA, uh, conversation analysis, is really, really good at doing. It breaks things down to the small uh, uh, minutiae of how people actually engage and interact at a conversational level. And customers at this point need to decide whether to choose this scan button, remember the plus button, or the money buttons in their apps. How do they do that? Generally, they ask. So I'm going to be an instance of where people does that. In this case, the customer is about to pay, but again, not sure about who scans whom. So asks that question, do you scan me or do I scan you? He opens his phone, presses the plus button, get the membership. No, they don't. 
Oh, how do I pay for that? Do I scan? Do you scan me or I scan you? I scan. So phone, payment results, press is finish, the interaction is complete. Again, let me just play that briefly over to you again. Phone. Ready now. Uh, then opportunities, yeah. both sides of the interaction are possible. How do I pay for this? Do you scan me or do I scan you? I scan you. Right, let's work through how that functions. So the customer is opening a WeChat on the phone. This isn't at no point they're making a decision about how do I pay or do you scan or do I do I run this or do you run this interaction? Pressing the pl the plus button just gets you to the point of making that decision. Do you have a membership? Yeah, not important. Uh, no, no. Um, then how should I pay? That's a kind of very broad question, but it seems to be something that is recognizable at this point of the interaction. It's not Alipay or WeChat Pay because that's something sub subsequent to this. But you know, what what do I do to progress this? Do you scan me or do I scan you? And the answer comes through, I scan you, yes. WeChat and Alipay are both okay. It doesn't matter which one you go. So he presses the money button. The money button is where, uh, he can, he presents the QR code, allows him to at least allows them to access his wallet. Uh, he presents his code. The 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 seller scans that code, and um, that interaction progresses. So what do we see in the analysis? You know, customer's ready to pay, but he's really not sure what to do at this point. And uh, you know, this is kind of I can't remember. This is this is the the money button, and this is the scan button. He's at that point. How does he differentiate that? Because both of them will have different forms of money work for him. So we have it, although the symmetric, the interfaces or the opportunities here are symmetrical, the activities that follow that symmetricality are likely to be different. Again, those things are resolved by asking the question that we've seen before. Do you scan me or do I scan you? So how do, what do customers actually see in those different sorts of fragments? So in the first one, they see that scan gun. In the second one, it's very visible, but they've got a QR code that's there. And there's nothing else going on. There's no other, no visible scan gun. The third one is very different because that scan machine is kind of hidden. It's not, it's a bit ambiguous as to what it is. Is it for scanning the goods? Is it to do something else? So how do they make those judgments? And this is where it comes back to terms that you'll see a lot within HCI and interaction design. This is to do with the seeability of the materials within that scene and the affordances that the devices offer uh, to be able to make, you know, to, to understand what they, what they actually do and what their functions are. Only one of those settings, of course, then becomes visibly seen as, as ambiguous. And that's the third one, because it's not clear what the devices do and how you interact with them and how you make sense of what the next stage of the progression is. And that's also present in loads of other, do you see me, do you scan me or do I scan you uh, questions. But this also goes slightly beyond this issue of ambiguity uh, actually goes a little bit beyond scanning direction. Users also need to know, sometimes also need to know what uh, what to do when they actually even know the scanning direction. So it's, do you scan me or I scan you? But then what do I do? When well, the customer shows the QR code and there's loads of different scanning devices. And that means that people don't actually know how the scanning devices themselves are to be used. So they have this other issue of ambiguity, which often requires a level of instruction from, and, and we see a fair amount of this. So the problems again here, let me show you very quickly this video because I realize we're moving on in time. Um, the problem is again, a do you scan me or, uh, do I scan you or do you scan me question? So there's this other secondary element of how do I get scanned once I know that direction. Here, the customer comes to a convenience store as you'll see to buy a notebook. The customer holds the phone and lifts his finger. What am I doing? above the phone. He's not sure what scanning direction is going to go and ask that question. Do you scan me or do I scan you? Helpfully, the, uh, the, the seller says, I scan you. The customer then positions the QR code, but it's in the wrong place because he's misjudged where the scanner is and what the scanner is. The employee points to the scanning area and the QR code is then scanned. So the customer picks up the goods, 
walks in with the notebook. I sit down. Do you want to buy some coffee? I have breakfast. Fine. Um, he's waiting to scan the goods. Do you scan me or I scan you? I scan. Open your QR payments code. Puts the money button. It's got the QR code. Uh, 4.51. Scans it. And moves on. Again, what I want to show you is that little last bit. It's a very, very short slide. So hope you give me the chance to show that again. That little last bit. Which I kind of lost over slightly. Comes in. Puts it down. You're sitting there. What do I do? You scan me? Or do I scan you? I scan. Open your QR. And he holds it down here near where the other scanner was. But strangely, this, yeah. this uh, camera in the top of the fake iPhone is the, is the scanner. Very confusing to know what to do here. So he tries to scan the notebook, places his left thumb above the screen, looks at the scanning machine. Do you scan me or do I scan you? Open your payment QR code. And he presses the Alipay, not WeChat. He does Alipay this time, the pay button. But it's the same thing as having uh, showing the uh, money button uh, WeChat, which brings up the QR code. Uh, the employee passes the goods to him. He turns the, turns the phone screen to the employee where the scanner was for the goods, but it doesn't work because he puts it in the wrong place. He isn't scanned and needs to be redirected like this to where it is, points to the scanning area. Uh, uh, here to have it scanned. Thank you for using Alipay. So the SCA uh, here is this announcement that goes up in the shop. Thank you for using Alipay. It just means that the receipt has been awarded. So the customer needs to actively ask what's going on. And the seller, very interestingly, barely does any of the scanning work. So the customer is opening the phone. The customer is preparing the payment. The customer presents and scans the QR code. So this is all work done by the customer. And the scanning machine itself is ambiguous and very unfamiliar because there are so many different ways that you can scan and there's lots of innovation in this space. But really interesting to hear what she says is, I scan you. And she's not actually meaning I scan you. She actually means something rather different. So there's a logical inconsistency in the way that the um, interaction model works that doesn't actually map to this kind of expected performance down here. I scan you means you will scan on my scanning machine here, uh, not actually done by the employee here. You'll see this is very different to those, those other forms of interaction because light talk, this kind of degree of talk is used here to identify and resolve those problems and to coordinate the different media that are being used and pulled, called into play here. So this is a strange form of interaction where the seller is not actually doing the scanning despite them talking about it, which takes us kind of beyond this idea of pure directionality and symmetry. And that requires customers to do much more work, which leads me into the next point here. This leads to more work, more work for customers. And that's kind of emerged as this kind of phenomena that you do see a lot of in digital systems, that of the working customer. Where work that was done by assistants is now digitally kind of presented back to the user um, as work that you, customer, need to do. And there's a couple of variants of that where the customer does the presentation of the QR code, you saw this, the seller does the scanning work, or more sophisticated ones where the customer does the phone work and the scanning work. And the person um, who's, who's doing the sale has very little to do other than present the price. So this is the payoff here of, for the sellers of presenting their customers with doing more work. And what does that allow them to do? It allows the sellers to do more work. But we could ask, well, more of what? It allows them to do more work. It allows them to get on with things at the same time, serve other, uh, including serving other customers. But actually, it also helps them when they're doing physical work. So we're here in a kind of fishmonger, they're cutting up stuff or they're serving raw chicken. This is not something you want to be picking up devices or managing tills with. It allows them to do work in different sorts of ways. That's really helpful. For them. And I think this is where it fits. This, that we can learn something from this and this kind of emerging discipline of service design. Service design is, is about the process of creating and improving services. Uh, for people. And it's much more of a, um, a scripted performance. And you can see the sorts of things that happen uh, on the right hand side. So work here is shifted to the customers. And, and there's lots of kind of, te sort of te pure technology examples of this, but this is different. This is self-service behavior within a normal personal 
service encounter. It's not like that kind of vending machine example, or online shopping cart, because there's a person involved in it that could take payment that chooses to offload this onto the device. And here we see something that I think Don Norman talks about cognitive um, artifacts. He says cognitive artifacts aren't pure amplifiers. They don't simply allow you to do things uh, better or faster. They actually change what sellers can do. And we do see that they're allowed to get on with serving other customers. They're allowed to get on with their work instead of taking payments. It's not just better, it's different. Um, and the affordances, of course, of those change uh, how things um, can be done. So this is bringing me to the kind of overall conclusions of, of what I wanted to talk about around symmetry and ambiguity. I want to point out that you know, cash and credit cards are really asymmetrical forms of, of, of interaction and payment because they have, they have four different sorts of things and the payment is always a single direction. You can't actually use your credit card to set a price and to enter a price. You're simply passively handing this over. But that's not the way it has to happen. So China is different. They have symmetrical forms of payment. But as you can see, just because you can pay in a symmetrical way doesn't necessarily mean that the work you have to do to enable that payment is symmetrical. There's a very asymmetrical form of work and that has to, that has to be managed, usually managed through some form of talk. Although perhaps better digital design would mean that that could be handled in a more uh, flexible and um, straightforward way. So this symmetry does lead to flexibility, but here we see the ambiguity as being what you might classically call in HCI, inefficient or problematic. And now, as we've seen, digital payment here is simply not, this is the industry rhetoric, not smooth, not frictionless, not effortless, not simpler, not faster. And you know, this is not simply, this is simply not a problem of novelty. It's not that people don't understand how to use the technology. This is technology that's been used for a long time and it's still a problem. It's still a problem for people that needs to be fixed through uh, kind of social interactions and socially mediated uh, technology encounters. So that's often seen as, uh, the, the more possibility is often seen as bad design. With talk used to fix it, sometimes we've got lots of examples where people have to go and instruct the users. So the sellers actually become some, do start doing something different. They are often there to manage the payment process. You'll sometimes see this in, you know, a supermarket where someone's standing around basically fixing the problems of a uh, problem in the bagging area. But this is actually to do with the payment in a physical situation, a physical payment situation. And that requires new and additional work for sellers. So they can do work in different sorts of ways, but they also have a different purpose in the sales encounter. I want to finish off with like kind of a kind of a bigger scale up on idea, which is thinking about new payment technology. And we do think about new payment technology. If you read the press and you read lots of the kind of tech literature on this, they talk about payments as being, or the payments infrastructure as being something that has transformed and disruptively transformed the banking industry. What's well, actually incredibly disruptive here, not at the banking industry level here, but at the user level. And I think it's so important to think about uh, the disruption here that occurs at the user level. Now I'm going to stop here and think maybe there's some opportunities for design in here. So how can we support um, kind of how people make sense of whether they should lead the payment interaction or be the follower in the payment interaction? How can you use flashing lights, sounds, I don't know, audio feedback? Uh, how do we allow people to make sense of this is what a scanner is, this is where a scanner is, this is how a scanner is used, and what sorts of um, consistent behaviors across different sorts of scanners could be used, how symmetry might have value in interactions, and how might there might be further value in aspects of interaction. Um, how can we make better decisions? How can we um, give people more agency in the interactions that they have? if we give people opportunities for ambiguity, because that's not always a bad thing. Having a conversation about things that you're consuming is not always a bad thing. Um, so that can also be used a way of promoting conversations in places where you might otherwise not have much of a reason to have a conversation about things, or it might be awkward to do that. Anyway, I'm gonna stop. Any ideas that could take this further, I would be delighted to hear. Um, any methodological questions, I would also be interested in hearing about too.
Okay. Thank you so much. And as ever, we've got the microphone that needs to be passed around as the magic. Not to amplify anyone's voices, I might add, <laughs> uh, but instead to people online. Very interesting talk. Thank you very much. I was just curious because right now we looked into um, like always like, okay, there's a clerk standing there's like, it's like clerk to customer interaction. Mm, but so mm. for example, if you look, for example, now down Tottenham into the Lidl or in the Aldi's, yeah. it's like you have the self-checkouts, right? It's like I'm... Yeah getting is like not even the, to interact with a clerk anymore i just have mm -hmm. like the machine in front of me yeah. so have you looked into these kinds of interactions where basically um even these kinds of last human interactions getting um slipped away because of course like it's a money issue right so like mm -hmm. if i have to hire somebody a clerk it costs mm -hmm. money if i put a machine in there if i put 12 machines there yeah. and one clerk can manage it yeah. i can save money yeah so uh To a degree, I think that thing that that's already happening now. I mean, if the, the, these payments are kind of so integrated, and the sorts of things that we have here. I mean, again, this is a surprise to me when I was seeing the videos from China, especially Shenzhen, Shenzhen and uh, Shanghai. Incredibly sophisticated, far more sophisticated machines in the supermarkets than we have here. So they are used to these these kind of interactions. Not sure exactly where to the the the, the, the question comes from um, in kind of answering it but i but I, so this is so, so let me just come back to you on that it what what is it that's different around the interactions that you're 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 asking i think it's a difference like with the symmetry aspect mm. mentioning. so mm. for example in the ones which we had in the example there was always still um parasocial relations yeah, yeah. interactions like yeah. okay i see another human standing in front of me yeah, yeah. versus when i'm going to read it for example then This other person starts running around and saying, "Like, twelve, yeah, sixteen, yeah, you yeah. out." Yeah, there is like still like okay, some sort of thing. It's like yeah, yeah. it's often uh, looking at me somehow. Yeah, like closer to me. Yeah, I, I mean, it does. It does. It both takes things away, but it also adds stuff. So you can also have conversations about things that you probably had no control about. So when you're making a credit card payment, literally, it doesn't work is the only question you can really say to someone. Whereas here you have a range of different flexible, flexible options and different payment mechanisms, even with the same tool. So you can have slightly different interactions. Other people can get on with other work, but you can also kind of debug your own payment problems and offer alternatives using the same technology. So I think that's kind of not answered your question, but at least it kind of opens up the space of having a conversation and also opens up the space of solving the problems you have with sales encounters. Hi, um, thanks for that. Um, was really interesting and the analysis itself, um, yeah, it was great to think about on this level. Um, I'd like to kind of push beyond the ethnomethodological framing, if I may. Um, so, um, similarly, if, if I go into Cafe Nero, then I can um, have my QR code scans because I've got the Nero app. Mm -hmm. And the reason why the, why I am the one being scanned is because actually outside of the situated action, I have a sense of like, I, I have ownership of mm -hmm. um, this and I'm earning rewards, et cetera. And, 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 and what I find interesting about these kind of interactions is unlike where it is just contactless and every interaction looks exactly the same and there is all of this kind of invisibility mm. uh, one thing they can do is to add texture um, by which i make sense of what i have so if we go from an ideal where you have a certain amount of coins here are my coins and i really am kind of like thinking through it through the interaction that there's that kind of tangibility which in, in terms of the sense it's not just the sense in terms of like what's normal but i actually increase my understanding or increase my like sense of like what do i value mm. um here and, and mm. the the values and meanings are being no into an interaction it does it re it does refocus you on thinking about how you want to pay and what sorts of what it is that you're paying for slightly i think i I'm not sure that people, like the people we've seen, make those kinds of decisions. But actually, there's a, there's another issue around this, which is outside of the, the talk, which is each of these systems holds money in a kind of closed 
wall system. So Alipay and WeChat Pay are very different systems. You can't move money between them. So you have to think about how do you allocate money to these different parts. Um, so it's, it's, it's like outside the symmetry of the, the interaction. But then, this is another paper we've been working on. You actually have people who try to work within one of those systems and they pass, so they, they even talk about their WeChat Pay friends and their Alipay friends. And this is the sort of thing I use my Alipay for. And this is the sort of thing I use my WeChat Pay for. You probably see that with the, the coins that you get as a, uh, as a coupon or whether you're working with a co-op bank, which is a wonderful bank to have, there's lots of green stuff, but actually is not accepted or doesn't have, you know, because it doesn't have high interest rate, I actually keep all my money in this one, um, which means I can't make large purchases with the bank that I would like to be using all the time. So it does cause different ways of thinking about how do I spend, how do I make choices, how do I progress in interaction, and what do I talk about when I'm having those interactions? I'm really embarrassed, here's my... American Express card. Sorry, I'm not a corporate fascist. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for that. I've got lots of questions, but I'll focus on one, um, which is conspicuously all your interactions were about one article. Yeah. What happens when you have the little shop where you're buying for the week mm. and how does that change the whole dynamic i mean did you only did you intentionally set these things up in very small shops where one's one article transactions were common did you pick one article transactions no. for analysis or how does it scale to there, those there's a practical element to this is that and it's quite easy to get a camera on someone's you know, store because they're the owner of the store. To go to a supermarket, you have to go right up the supermarket to say, can we have a camera on your store? And then you have to get permission from the customers to do that. So it is more difficult. We do, however, have some of that data and you don't see big differences in it. The only thing that you see with the big shops is that they tend to have um, their own scanners. So you see these quite odd scanners that people are really struggling to use, particularly if this is the first time they've used it. They have to be really directed and instructed on how to stick your QR code in front of that, that odd scanner. But of course, all the conversations going on in the queue beside you, um, where people say, oh, I've never been here before. This is, real, this is real nuisance. But it doesn't seem to make a big difference whether it's one purchase item or multiple purchase items. And again, in a supermarket, you can't have multiple people being served easily at the same time on the same till because you know, there's, there's someone doing it for you, doing the, 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 tran the transfer for you. But you can imagine, were you to completely um, change the layout of those things, you could have someone managing multiple tills where people were running, through, were running things through in a, in a more sophisticated way than they do with the self-service tills at the supermarket. Or yeah. the scanner checkout. Or, Sorry, yeah. I know yeah, yeah. I don't think it makes it. Scanning every yeah. article to put it in the back. It, but it's more. It, also, the big supermarkets are more. It's more typical for them to have a scanner gun, because it's it, it is more efficient and it's typical, and they want to be in control of the interaction. Um, good to see conversation analysis and ethno being used alongside Bill Gaither and Don Norman and the three of them I wouldn't put together, no, no. but it, it was good. <laughs> nice to see that. Um, uh, about a year ago, I used to go to Waterstones, which Dylan's on the mm. corner there, and I used to have a paper loyalty card. It had 10 little uh, icons of cups. I'd mm. uh, get my coffee mm. and then I'd just pass it and nothing would be said and they would just stamp it. Mm. And then I'd know at number 10, I was going to get a free cup of coffee. So then I didn't even offer my credit card because I got it. Now I have one of these, which uh, they asked me if I've got a Waterstones card and I uh, they scan it. I have no idea what I've got on this and they don't tell me. And so it's only after like a while they say, oh, you've got 10 pounds. Would you like a free cup of coffee? Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's an asymmetry there in terms yeah. of the visibility and the information. And also the anticipation is really exciting when you get to number 10 on your <laughs> paper card. <and> say, <laughs> can I have a free cup of coffee? <laughs> I'm not really a sucker for loyalty cards, but that's that one. Whereas mm -hmm. now it's gone digital. It's a different mm -hmm. transaction, the asymmetry. I wondered what you thought about. Well, I, how... I think there's a corporate decisions around the, the choice of the use of the media and the, the visibility in there. So it's actually really good for the companies not to know that you've got one coffee left because you're going to be more careless with the card and probably you lose it or ask for another card because you forgot it and then you spread your 
um, your coffee, your free coffees across multiple cards and then never reclaim them or bin them. Whatever. So it's useful for them to do that. Whereas when it's on a phone, it's got more of the qualities of the card, um, possibly less anticipation because you still have to go into it. You still have to sit there and prepare for it. And if you haven't got enough, then you have to go back out the app. Everyone is in the queue behind you. So whilst it gives you choices, you have to make explicit choices to, to use that app with its... Um, but, yeah, but in terms of the actual interaction has changed. So interaction's changed, you're in right. In the way in which you were sort of mm, saying that, mm. that before with the paper, there was no verbal conversation. Yeah. Yet, but now it, there is, and That's... I'm not sort of waiting for <laughs> them to give me feedback. But on, on the phone, I guess it's different again. So it, it does... The affordance of the yeah. uh, device does change it really um, does, and it? also the expectations that go around that. So it's, I mean, these little uh, um, micro interactions, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's interesting to think about it, how I, that affects. You know, it totally, change change, it totally changes the service account. You see that all the time within the different, even the different formats of how services and I'm going outside the technology stuff here, but to think about how it is where, for example, a, Kind of a cost there. The particular layouts of the, the systems mean that you pass through it in a different way and have different conversations about that's my coffee or that's your coffee or how's your name written on it. Um, all of those things change, very much change the experiences that we have in those things. And I think the technology is another one of those where you have different conversations about it, which changes the experience of what you do in those, pleasurably or otherwise. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> very interesting. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I have two questions, both of them related to scale somehow. Mm -hmm. um, one is more uh, practical, which is um, you've mentioned that you have 500 videos yeah. of this. Uh, how, the, like, what do you get from those? Like, how does it scale from what you showed us in the in, in those into, I guess, like counting things perhaps? And and the second one, which is vaguely related, is so you mentioned at the end this thing that is like disruptive at the user level. Oh. Did you think about linking? Um, and you, you also made a comment then now about the supermarket versus the small shop. Mm -hmm. If I recall correctly, the key thing uh, of this kind of payment is that they enable um, people to take payment without having to get credit checked by a bank. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. the, like in, in mm -hmm. the, the, the kind of stuff that in a supermarket is obvious, but if you have like a corner shop or even like a, a stall, mm -hmm. it would be tricky. Did you try to link in any way, like the sort of customer experience and like, in your video, <clears throat> the one with the stall at, at the QR code, while the other ones at something else. Are, are you looking at the data in, in that way, perhaps through those 500 videos? Not really looking beyond the nature, the transaction itself. I mean, I'm reliant on my co-authors to present that, and that is their particular interest. How is the micro-organization of the payment handled? I also don't Chinese, so I can't really look into those videos in a, in a detailed way. No, I think the, the way that the 500 videos, there was a very quick scan done over those ones. Um, then we catalogued uh, which ones were particularly interesting because they had more visible components in them, or they had, you know, in this case, we were looking at, do I scan you or do you scan me? That's not 500 videos or do you scan me? No, no, or do I scan you? A smaller proportion of those have this level of ambiguity. But there were enough of them to make us go, this is a bit weird. Uh, and then you notice that there's this symmetricality that's causing um you know, causing causing concerns and um, ambiguity in how you make a decision at that point. But it, 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 I was wondering if there is an interaction <clears throat> between that, <clears throat> sorry, interaction and like, is it the case? Because you you hinted at the fact that in supermarkets they want to be in control. Yeah. So they tend to scan um, mm. the customer. Is yeah. it is it like? always the case and is it the, like small small um shops tend to use one or or or, or is it random uh, it's a bit complicated because yes supermarkets generally do use the kind of ice i scan you um option but it's more complicated than that because some of these payment things are built into the interfaces of wechat of particular wechat and that might be embedded as a micro app within the system where these micro apps have payment capabilities built into them. So it's not just you would press the money button, you might also have some other features that pre present with emails or coupons or something else that comes from it. I mean, there's a lovely example of how, stepping aside slightly from our data, when you go into lots of restaurants, there's no menu. 
you go in and there's a QR code on the table. You click the QR code, the menu appears on your phone. You select the items on the menu you want, press OK. Payment automatically goes out and that's slid off into the, into the kitchen and the order's prepared. It knows what table you're on because the QR code is linked to something. You know, it takes it into a very, very different place from pure payment. It's an integrated service in which payment is part of it. So that's, you know, it is more complicated. Um, than, than, than purely this, this QR code. So it's kind of difficult to answer that in all cases. Um, again, I'm not sure I've answered yeah, all yeah, of your questions. Thank you. There. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, um, do you think there's a way that we can kind of reconcile some of the symmetrical and asymmetrical processes? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about kind of cross generations. Some people will value... Um, more symmetric ways of paying whereas different generations might value more asymmetric things like having longer conversations and um that side of it uh yeah do you think there's a happy medium at all i don't know um i didn't notice lots of differences with age groups there was a there's a clear cut off which people over you know this is this is a joke within in the, 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 the payment communities we were talking with, you know, if you're over 60, you pay with cash, right? Um, and that that's the clear differentiator. Everybody else seems to get on with it kind of fine. Mm -hmm. If you're younger people tend to use social media a lot more. Um, so if payments are integrated within the social media, that's probably how they will progress but actually in the shopping counters it doesn't make an awful lot of difference they're still faced with the same problems of how do i make sense of the context that i've got and the resources that are available to decide what should i do now and maybe i'm not seeing the post-covid thing where people are so nervous that they're not prepared to ask i don't know if that's a that, that's a, a common feature as common a feature it might be here in the in the uk where people have become asocialized but maybe we'll see something like that it finished in 2020. Yeah. There is people online as well. I'm just going to just chime in. I think we've already covered this, but I just wanted to say, so Cheng Fan has been visiting us from Northumbria. Oh, so uh, you've excellent. got a, a visitor from, from North, which is really nice to see. Uh, but lots of questions around uh, selection of videos mm -hmm. and setting and how that kind of happened why you focused in on particular supermarkets rather than restaurants and you know as you said there's yeah. 500 i think you've already kind of answered this that you kind of did a visual suite we, but just a little bit more can yeah. you expand a little bit more on that i process? wish i could answer that question better i was not heavily engaged in the participant selection and on the video selection here part of the reason you know, i'm not there um in fact i have a very uncomfortable story of being ejected out of china um, uh, and escorted to the border by border police for some reason. Um, no idea why. Uh, so I, I wasn't actually allowed into China. Um, but also because I don't speak Chinese, I'm not really sure what's going on in the video, so I can't make those catalog you know, category decisions about, oh, this is a particular kind of thing, because I'm not. it's not visible in it. We can look for things. We can, we can do that top-down analytic thing where there are certain things, sorts of things we'd like to look for, but actually we're also interested. But does that matter for this kind of style of qualitative research where it is very nuance driven? Yeah. So you need to have that I kind know. of cultural yeah. grounding. There is a cultural grounding thing there. Um, but I think more than the cultural grounding stuff, there's a linguistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I am guided by both of the other two authors on the study. Yeah. Uh, Christian and Zhang Zhang Yu um, are Mandarin speakers. Um, so they do yeah, they do get that nuance and they did the primary analysis and my my role here was largely to help glue some of the bits that they've been thinking about uh, and orient it a bit more to a design i'm not sure i've really done that terribly effectively here but design to think about where the design where do the current hci kind of topic orientations happen yeah good well i just wanted to say yep yeah, just to let you know there was a good 10 people online oh, wow. uh, and they were yeah great <laughs> and uh thank you very much really enjoyed the